All right, Mustangs, it's Mrs. Belo, and I am back with another edition of First Chapter Friday. And this week I have for you Enola Holmes and the Case of the Missing Marquis by Nancy Springer. Uh, this book was published um, several years ago, actually, in 2006. However, it has enjoyed a popular uh, resurgence because it is now a movie on Netflix starring Millie Bobby Brown. So um, many of you may be just becoming familiar with this book because of that Netflix movie. Uh, but it is a really, really neat series of books. There are six books in this series by Nancy Springer. And The Case of the Missing Marquis is the first. I hope you will enjoy it. Enola Holmes and the Case of the Missing Marquis by Nancy Springer. In the East End of London, after dark, August 1888. The only light struggles from the few gas street lamps that remain unbroken, and from pots of fire suspended above the cobblestones tended by old men selling boiled sea snails outside the public houses. The stranger, all dressed in black from her hat to her boots, slips from shadow to shadow as if she were no more than a shadow herself, unnoticed. Where she comes from, it is unthinkable for a female to venture out at night without the escort of a husband, father, or brother. But she will do whatever she must in order for, to search for the one who is lost. Wide-eyed beneath her black veil, she scans, seeks, watches as she walks. She sees broken glass on the cracked pavements. She sees rats boldly walking about, trailing their disgusting, hairless tails. She sees ragged children running barefoot amid the rats and the broken glass. She sees couples, men in red flannel vests and women in cheap straw bonnets, reeling along arm in arm. She sees someone lying along a wall, drunk or asleep, amid the rats or maybe even dead. Looking, she also listens. Somewhere, a hurdy-gurdy spews a jingle into the sooty air. The black-veiled seeker hears that tipsy music. She hears a little girl calling, Daddy! Da! Outside the door of a pub. She hears screams, laughter, drunken cries, street vendors calling, Oysters! Sauce them with vinegar and swallow them whole! Fatten school for a penny! She smells the vinegar. She smells gin, boiled cabbage, and hot sausage, the salty waft of the nearby harbor, and the stench of the River Thames. She smells rotting fish. She smells raw sewage. She quickens her pace. She must keep moving, for not only is she a seeker, but she is sought. The black-veiled hunter is hunted. She must walk far so that the men who are pursuing her cannot find her. At the next street lamp, she sees a woman with painted lips and smudged eyes waiting in a doorway. A handsome cab drives up, stops, and a man in a tailcoat and a shining sil silk top hat gets out. Even though the woman in the doorway wears a low-cut evening gown that might once have belonged to a lady of the gentleman's social class, the black-clad watcher does not think the gentleman is here to go dancing. She sees the prostitute's haggard eyes, haunted with fear no matter how much her red-smeared lips smile. One like her was recently found dead a few streets away, slit wide open. Averting her gaze, the searcher in black walks on. An unshaven man lounging against a wall winks at her. Mrs., what are you doing all alone? Don't you want some company? If he were a gentleman, he would not have spoken to her without being introduced. Ignoring him, she hastens past. She must speak to no one. She does not belong here. The knowledge does not trouble her, for she has never belonged anywhere. In a sense, she has always been alone. But her heart is not without pain as she scans the shadows. For she has no home now. She is a stranger in the world's largest city and she does not know where she will lay her head tonight. And if, Lord willing, she lives until morning, she can only hope to find the loved one for whom she is searching. Deeper, 
deeper into the shadows in East London dockside slums, she walks on, alone. Chapter the first. So that wasn't even the first chapter, that was the prologue. Chapter the first. I would very much like to know why my mother named me Enola, which backwards spells alone. Mum was, or perhaps still is, fond of ciphers, and she must have had something in mind, whether foreboding or a sort of left-handed blessing or already plans, even though my father had not yet passed away. In any event, you will do very well on your own, Enola, she would tell me nearly every day as I was growing up. Indeed, this was her usual absent-minded farewell as she went off with sketchbook, brushes, and watercolors to roam the countryside. And indeed, alone was very much how she left me when, on the July evening of my 14th birthday, she neglected to return to Ferndale Hall, our home. As I had my celebration anyway, with Lane the butler and his wife the cook, the absence of my mother did not at first trouble me. Although cordial enough when we met, Mum and I seldom interfered in one another's concerns. I assumed that some urgent business kept her elsewhere, especially as she had instructed Mrs. Lane to give me certain parcels at tea time. Mum's gifts to me consisted of a drawing kit, paper lead pencils, a pen knife for sharpening them, and India rubber erasers, all cleverly arranged in a flat wooden box that opened into an easel. A stout book entitled The Meanings of Flowers, including also notes upon the messages conveyed by fans, handkerchiefs, sealing wax, and postage stamps. A much smaller book of ciphers. While I could draw only to a limited degree, Mother encouraged the small knack I had. She knew I enjoyed my sketching, as I enjoyed reading almost any book on whatever topic. But as for ciphers... She knew I did not much care for them. Nevertheless, she had made this little book for me with her own hands, as I could plainly see, folding and stitching together pages she had decorated with dainty watercolor flowers. Obviously, she had been at work on this gift for some time. She did not lack thought for me, I told myself, firmly, several times throughout the evening. While I had no idea where Mum might be, I expected she would either come home or send a message during the night. I slept peacefully enough. However, the next morning, Lane shook his head. No, the lady of the house had not returned. No, there had been no word from her. Outside, gray rain fell, fitting my mood, which grew more and more uneasy. After breakfast, I trotted back upstairs to my bedroom, a pleasant refuge where the wardrobe, washstand, dresser, and so forth were painted white with pink and blue stenciled posies around the edges. Cottage furniture, folk called it. Cheap stuff, suitable only for a child. But I liked it. Most days. Not today. I could not have stayed indoors, indeed. I could not sit down except hastily to put galoshes over my boots. I wore shirt and knickerbockers, comfortable clothing that had previously belonged to my older brothers, and over these I threw a waterproof. All rubbery, I thumped downstairs and took an umbrella from the stand in the hallway. Then I exited through the kitchens, telling Mrs. Lane, I am going to have a look around. Odd. These were the same words I said nearly every day when I went out to look for things, though generally I didn't know what. Anything. I would climb trees just to see what might be there. Snail shells with bands of maroon and nut yellow. Nut clusters, birds' nests. And if I found a magpie's nest, I would look for things in it. Shoe buttons, bits of shiny ribbon, somebody's lost earring. I would pretend that something of great value was lost, and I was searching. Only this time, I was not pretending. Mrs. Lane, too, knew it was different this time. She should have called, Where's your hat, Miss Enola? For I never wore one but she said nothing as she watched me go. Go to have a look around for my mother. I really thought I could find her myself. Once out of sight of the kitchen, I began running back and forth like a beagle, hunting for any sign of mum. Yesterday morning, as a birthday treat, I had been allowed to lie abed. Therefore, I had not seen my mother go out. 
but assuming that she had, as usual, spent some hours drawing studies of flowers and plants, I looked for her first on the grounds of Ferndale. Managing her estate, Mum liked to let growing things alone. I rambled through flower gardens run wild, lawns invaded by gorse and brambles, forests shrouded in grape and ivy vines, and all the while the gray sky wept rain on me. The old collie dog, Reginald, trotted along with me until he grew tired of getting wet, then left to find shelter. Sensible creature. Soaked to my knees, I knew I should do likewise, but I could not. My anxiety had accelerated along with my gait until now terror drove me like a lash. Terror that my mother lay out here somewhere, hurt or sick or a fear I could not entirely deny as mum was far from young. She might have been struck down by heart failure. She might be, but one could not even think it so baldly. There were other words expired, crossed over, passed away, gone to join my father. No, please. One would think that as mother and I were not close, I should not have minded her disappearance very much, but quite the contrary. I felt dreadful because it seemed all my fault if anything had gone badly with her. Always I felt to blame for well, for whatever, for breathing, because I had been born indecently late in mother's life. A scandal, a burden, you see. And always I had counted upon setting things right after I was grown. Someday, I hoped, somehow, I would make of my life a shining light that would lift me out of the shadow of disgrace. <coughs> and then, you understand, my mother would love me. But she had to be alive and I must find her. Searching, I crisscrossed forest where generations of squires had hunted hares and grouse. I climbed up and down the shelving, fern-draped rock of the grotto for which the estate was named, a place I loved, but today I did not linger. I continued to the edge of the park where the woods ended and the farmland began, and I searched onward into the fields, for Mum may very well have gone there for the sake of the flowers. Being not too far from the city, Ferndale tenants had taken to farming bluebells and pansies and lilies instead of vegetables, as they could better prosper by delivering flesh, fresh blossoms daily to Covet Garden. Here grew rows of roses, crops of corporuses, flaming patches of zinnias and poppies, all for London. Looking on the fields of flowers, I dreamt of a bright city where every day smiling maids placed fresh bouquets in every chamber of the mansions, where every evening gentlewomen and royal ladies decked and scented themselves, their hair and gowns with anemones and violets. London, where? But today the acres of flowers hung sodden with rain, and my dreams of London lasted only a breath or two before evaporating like the mist steaming up from the fields vast fields, miles of fields. Where was mother? In my dreams, you see, my mum dreams, not the London ones, I would find her myself. I would be a heroine. She would gaze up at me in gratitude and adoration when I rescued her. But those were dreams and I was a fool. So far I had searched only a quarter of the estate, much less the farmlands. If mum lay injured, she'd give up the ghost before I could find her all by myself. Turning, I hurried back to the hall. There, Lane and Mrs. Lane swooped upon me like a pair of turtle doves upon the nest, he plucking sopping coat and umbrella and boots for me, while she hustled me toward the kitchens to get warm. While it was not her place to scold me, she made her views plain. A person would have to be simple-minded to stay out in the rain for hours on end, she told the big coal burning stove as she levered one of its lids off. Don't matter what a person is, common or aristocrat, if a person catches a chill, it could kill her. This to the tea kettle she was placing on the stove. Consumption is no respecter of a person's or circumstances, to the tea canister. There was no need for me to respond, for she wasn't talking to me. She would not have been permitted to say anything of the sort. 
to me. It's all very well for a person to be of an independent mind without going looking for quinsy or pleurisy or pneumonia or worse to the teacups. Then she turned to face me and her tone also about faced. Begging your pardon, Miss Enola, will you take luncheon? Won't you draw your chair closer to the stove? I'll brown like toast if I do. No, I do not require luncheon. Has there been any word of mother? Although I already knew the answer, for Lane or Mrs. Lane would have told me at once if they had heard anything. Still, I could not help asking. Nothing, miss. She swaddled her hands in her apron as if wrapping a baby. I stood. Then there are some notes I must write. Miss Enola, there is no fire in the library. Let me bring the things to you here at the table, miss. I felt just as glad not to have to sit in the great leather chair in that gloomy room. Into the warm kitchen, Mrs. Lane fetched paper imprinted with our family crest, the ink pot and the fountain pen from the library desk, along with some blotting paper. Dipping the pen into the ink on the cream-colored stationery, I wrote a few words to the local constabulary, informing them that my mother seemed to have gone astray and requesting them to kindly organize a search for her. Then I sat thinking, did I really have to? Unfortunately, yes, I could put it off no longer. More slowly, I wrote another note, one that would soon wing for miles via wire to be printed out by a teletype machine as Lady Eudora Vernay Holmes missing since yesterday. Stop. Please advise. Stop. Enola Holmes. I directed this wire to Mycroft Holmes of Pall Mall in London, and also the same message to Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street, also in London. My brothers. And that's the first chapter of Enola Holmes, The Case of the Missing Marquis by Nancy Springer. Um, it's a really great series. I love this series. I came upon it when it first opened, uh, came out in 2006. It's one of my favorites. Um, it is, of course, a, a spinoff on a Sherlock Holmes type mystery with the, the sister. Enola is the sister. Um, it's a great book series. The Netflix movie is really good, too. But the plot of the book and the plot of the movie are different like they're similar but they're different so it's really good i'm usually super critical of books that have been turned into movies but i really like this book and i really like that movie even though um they were different the changes they made in the movie i thought were good changes for the plot of the story um so anyway i hope you enjoy check it out we do have two copies of the first book in the series um one copy of all the rest of the books in the series and all of the books are available in Sora as um, ebooks and audiobooks. I hope you will enjoy.